and good night. This is Akashvani. In the program spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on e-mobility sector fueling India's net zero target. The participants are Narendra Taneja, energy expert and Anubha Rohadgi, anchor. India aims to achieve a 45% reduction in energy emission intensity by 2030 and energy independence by 2047. One way to achieve this ambitious goal is a wider adoption of electric vehicles. However, India's dependence on imports for essential elements hinder its e-mobility drive. To address this shortcoming, a report on e-mobility R&D roadmap for India was launched recently. We have with us energy expert Mr. Narendra Taneja to discuss this issue. Mr. Taneja, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Mr. Taneja, why was the need felt to have an e-mobility R&D roadmap for India? We have been working as the country on electric vehicles for quite some time now. If you look at the total population electric mobility in India already, and more than that, kind of enthusiasm that the EV vehicles are getting from the people on the ground is the result of all that. So if you look at, for instance, EV literacy, EV ambitions, it's pretty high in the country. People may not be owning EV yet, but you look at people, especially the young people, they seem to be kind of more in favor of electric vehicles than conventional vehicles, which is a very good news. So therefore, at the same time, the government has declared that, you know, we want to achieve energy independence by 2047. So how do you achieve that? If you want to achieve energy independence at the same time while you're working to reduce emissions, it is important that we are in a position, A, to have domestic resources in terms of research and development. Also, that we are not much dependent on imports. And three, what is very important at the same time, that, you know, to come out with our own solution in terms of technology, which kind of more compatible with India's terrains, India's mountains, India's hinterlands, and India's peninsular India, and so on and so forth. Basically, which is kind of more India-specific. So the roadmap report that you mentioned is basically focusing on all these areas. I mean, energy storage cells, for instance, one area which you plan to focus. Because energy storage cells you may need in the Arctic Circle, or in Africa, Latin America, might be slightly different than what we need. Because in our country, in summer, the temperature can go up to 47. At the same time, you go up in the mountains, the Himalayas temperatures can be minus 30. Even in summer, in some places up in the mountains, as you go up. So, idea is to kind of, you know, go for research and development, which are basically these cells, energy storage cells are customized for India. And at the same time, they're economically viable. Three, at the same time, that we can export them to friendly countries or the other countries, particularly in the global south. And the same goes for, you know, that how do we aggregate and also materials that you need, recycling that you would be required to do, and charging and refueling infrastructure. We still, in some places, are using either foreign technology or foreign equipment or foreign ideas. Ideas to go for a solution which are basically customized for India's climatic and economical and social requirements. You just know the roadmap that we are talking about, it has listed, of course, four broad areas, energy storage cells. Three areas include EV aggregates, materials and recycling and charging and refueling. Can you explain a little bit more about these three areas as well? The idea is that how do we kind of make sure that we can build capacity and any capability and the capacity so that we can go for mass introduction EV electric vehicles on our roads. Right now, if you look at it, kind of majority of these are being sold in the urban centers. But the idea is that you can take them further. And at the same time, when it comes to EV aggregates, we have to think in terms of buses, the trucks. We have to think in terms of the smaller ships we can operate in, inland waterways, and also maybe even along the coast. So that's the whole idea that how we go and aggregate the whole thing. And there are a number of other areas where, for instance, we think for transportation purposes, electric vehicles can be used. And the same goes for materials. For instance, if you look at a car today, a conventional car is mainly steel. And of course, you have enforced plastic and so on and so forth that's increasing to be used, but we use a lot of metal. So idea here is that how can we on the one hand go for electric vehicles at the same time to the extent possible, we are using materials which are locally available so that we can keep the economics of the whole thing under control. 
and also thinking at the same time, which I think is very important for a country like India. So the car population in India is growing. Already we are selling 300,000 EVs in the country. And if you look at the growth, growth is actually the graph is only going up and up and up. So the result is that you, know, you have to think, for instance, if the car reaches the expiry date, what do you do with that? How do you recycle? You recycle in such a way that is climate friendly, is water friendly, is earth friendly. And at the same time, it's kind of society friendly. So ideas to start working on that at this stage, actually aggregating it or you're working on a technology solution and all that. So it's basically thinking through the future. And the fourth point is, as I mentioned, is the charging. Because the charging is, is still a challenge. You see a lot of EVs around, but the charging thing is still catching up. So how do we do that, especially when it comes to, it's very easy, for instance, to set up a petrol station, as we call them, or the gas station, as people call that. But when it's a charging station, you have to bring the charging infrastructure closer to your home. Let's say if you live in a society in Delhi, in Dwaraka, or in Bombay, or in Bangalore, or in Hyderabad, or Chennai, or Calcutta, for that matter, that it can be a kind of collaboration with the society or with the resident welfare associations. Yes, you are setting up the company, setting up the charging stations uh, in such a way that people have access and the meeting is easy. And at the same time, at the time, in, let's say between 12 o'clock in the night and 5 in the morning, when most people switch off their electricity bulbs in winter, you don't need air conditioner so that the rates are such, the tariffs are such that people are actually encouraged to go for EV and EVs are instant. So the, this will have to be done in partnership with the society. It's very different from the way you sell petrol or diesel today. The same goes for then refueling the batteries, etc. Once you charge, but you also need to kind of, you know, replacing batteries and so on and so forth. So all that. So idea is to go for research and development build a roadmap so that we have got solutions which are 100% compatible with the way we live in India, with the way, for instance, our societies are, our houses are, our roads are, our cities are, so that we don't have to look beyond India, let's say, for technology or for health or for consultancy and so forth. Instead, actually, we can provide that to other countries, let's say, Latin America or Africa. So, like we were talking, one of the hindrances in India achieving sustainability and Atmanirbharta in this area is because we're dependent on imports for essential elements and which is why this roadmap has been launched. Now, the government, of course, has for its part launched this roadmap. How important is the role of the private sector so far as R&D is concerned? When you look at the conventional energy, whether it's coal or it's oil or natural gas, and if you go beyond, let's say, nuclear power, the role of government is very big because by very nature, these uh, kind of sectors, these fuels require bigger government participation, regulation, including the safety issues and so on and so forth. But when it comes to electric vehicles or solar or renewable energy, most countries are doing that following kind of more decentralized approach, where the central government, the state government, the city government, eventually even the panchayats are going to play a very, very important role because they will be big stakeholders and they will be involved. And rolling out the whole thing without their participation may not be that smooth or may be costly. So that is the whole approach. And therefore, you see the strategy is basically to add from this very stage, whether it's policy making or building the policy infrastructure or building the infrastructure as a whole can be used together with them. And when you look at the role of the private sector, if you have to build this kind of infrastructure, let's say in a small town or in a village or in a panchayat or in a, even in a big city like Delhi or Bombay, the private sector will find it, as I said, we need to decentralize. And when you decentralize, it will be easier for the private sector actually to come in. A, the total cost or in these things is not very high, which means even the medium-sized companies and SMEs, they can actually be roped in and they will find it very beneficial. And cooperatives, where the cooperative movements are successful, let's say in Gujarat, Maharashtra and Karnataka and some other parts of the country. And at the same time, the youth and the women and all that, they can come together and they can set up their own entity and venture into it. So the role of private sector is going to be very, very important. And when I look at, for instance, the picture 10 years from now, I think the share of private sector in the whole exercise, especially when it comes to the downstream and the retail and the distribution on the ground, is going to be very, very substantial. How important is the role of institutions of higher learning and research institutions such as the IIT in inculcating this idea of research into this field? 
whether R and D, whether IITs or smaller institutions, and for that research and development divisions of energy companies such as ONGC, Indian Oil, Petroleum, or the private sector energy giants, I think is going to be very very important because this is kind of a new subject which is emerging, and this is in the sense that you know you will need to kind of create infrastructure for that. You need to train teachers because in the time to come, in about five to seven years. We don't need a big army of people who are trained to handle all this across the country. We're talking of lakhs of people who are trained, who are equipped, and at the same time can handle these things: the technical part, the maintenance part, the financial part of the whole exercise, then the training people down there. So there are kind of multiple verticals we need to address. So this roadmap is basically is going to along the way is also going to address all these issues. As I said, that already if you look at it, this is going to be a massive job creator where people are going to kind of find jobs. Let's say typically in a society or in a community and all that, literally by hundreds. So this is a new area, sunrise area in terms of job opportunities. Now, one of the suggestions in this roadmap is the development of an Aadhaar number for batteries for electric vehicles. What exactly is this idea, and can you elaborate on it and its benefits? We are now fast moving into the age of artificial intelligence, and which means that you know, the role of technology is going to be even bigger and important. So the whole idea is that looking at a car as a kind of unit which is also going to use computer chips and computers and eventually artificial intelligence one way or another whether in terms of navigation or monitoring or refueling and so many other things so therefore it would help if you have got some kind of identity number which is national so that you take your car wherever you want at the same time using that numbers all those kind of stakeholders in your car or in the unit are kept in the loop so that they can provide the service that you need from them or any kind of intelligence that you might need in terms of send your car for service or don't use it or the weather is like this and so on so the whole idea is to have a kind of create a unit a create a kind of digital number so that all other things can be linked into it and you can basically take advantage of all the services which are already there and which are going to be even further as you move into connecting electric vehicles or the road transport with the, with the, the new technology like artificial right. intelligence how important are the faster adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicles or FAME and the PLI schemes for encouraging the e-mobility drive? The FAME 2 scheme has already ended, but surely EV makers will hope that Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman announces FAME 3 scheme when she presents the budget on July 23rd. Any kind of incentive would be good, whether incented by the federal government, the central government, if you look around in other parts of the world, for instance, many cities in Europe, they don't charge any parking fee if you're using electric vehicles. There are many areas which are restricted for petrol or diesel vehicles, but the electric vehicles can go there. They are allowed access. And then also when you buy electric vehicles, you get tax exemptions and so on and so forth. So I think since we are still a kind of oil economy, and majority of cars which are sold every day are actually petrol and diesel. But at the same time, as I said, especially young people are find they are actually, many of them ideologically wants to move in the direction or wants to buy electric vehicles. So therefore, I think any kind of incentives will be very helpful. But at the same time, we know we are not a very rich country. So therefore, there is a limit to what the government can do in terms of subsidy or and all that. But at the same time, the good thing is that if you look at the history of last electric vehicles in India, when we first started talking about EVs, majority of car manufacturers were reluctant. And many of them, they were basically even resistant. Today, the situation is totally different. Practically every single car manufacturer is already making electric vehicles. Uh, those who are not, they are planning to make them in big numbers and even become an export hub for that. So this is a kind of massive cultural shift as far as the manufacturers are concerned. At the same time, look in Delhi, for instance, you can meet thousands of youngsters who basically when they are taking a taxi, they call only electric vehicles, which I think is again on from the consumer side is a major development. So this transition takes time. But as I said, you know, it took some time. But when you look at the results of last three months, a lot is happening. And I'm sure it's going to reflect in the budget also. And my personal feeling is that we should encourage more people to diversify into manufacturing electric vehicles. Apart from increased focus on R&D to strengthen e-mobility, what other measures are needed over the next few years for India to achieve its emission-related goals? Two things. First is that, you know, we need to kind of, when we talk about electric vehicles, we, the first question that comes into mind is where electricity is going to come from. How do we generate electricity? 
Today, look at India, for instance. Bulk of our electricity is coming from coal. That is, will start changing after some time. It is not going to change anytime soon. Main idea is that how can we actually produce more electricity, more economically, and more so that is more affordable for the ordinary people, number one. Number two is that how can do we produce this electricity in such a way that we keep emissions under control, or we bring down emissions substantially or rather radically. So these are two major challenges. Thank you, Mr. Tanija, for speaking with us. Thanks. You were listening to a discussion on e-mobility sector fueling India's net zero target. The participants were Narendra Tanija, energy expert, and Anubha Rohatgi, anchor. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of Akashvani. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. 